Hi there. Welcome to the Secret Life of the Soil Superheroes presentation. This presentation is about caring for soil ecology and biodiversity. My name is Sandra and I'm a passionate soil microbiologist and mycologist, a person that loves fungi. This presentation is based on the soil restoration course I've created, which you can look up at the soilrestorationcourse.com website. And it is designed to regenerate the earth from the ground up by understanding and cultivating healthy soil ecosystems. Today we'll talk about the soil ecosystem, which we can endearingly also call the poop loop. And that's because it relates to the relationships between plants, bacteria, fungi, protozoa and nematodes and how they interact via the nutrient cycling with one another. And then we'll talk about how we can work with the soil superheroes in order to regenerate and restore the earth. So why would we even care for soils and why would we want to learn about them? Well, they are the providers of all the nutrients that we need to build our own bodies and upon which all ecosystems rely. They produce oxygen, provide support and create biodiversity. They provide us with food and they provide us with shelter because we build our homes out of the materials that come from soil. And a nation that destroys its soils destroys itself. Roosevelt said after the Great Depression in the US, which followed the great destruction of the soil ecosystem upon which the food resources relied. It is also the largest terrestrial carbon pool. Greater than two thirds of carbon are stored in the soil, and that's three times the carbon in the atmosphere and four times the carbon present in vegetation. And you can see on the right, there's an image showing an ecosystem of soil around the root with nooks and crannies for all the little creatures to live in. It is definitely a living thing. And you can see in the image on the right, it is a very dense ecosystem full of life. And on the left, you can see that one gram of soil may contain several thousand different taxa. That's several thousand different types of organisms, a billion bacterial cells, and 200 meters of fungal hyphae. That's the cells of fungi traveling through the soil ecosystem. So we really shouldn't treat soil like dirt because it's a living thing. It is very much in symbiotic relationship with us because we breathe out carbon dioxide and through the process of photosynthesis, plants transform carbon dioxide, our very out breath, into oxygen for us to breathe. They release water in the process by transpiration, by living themselves, and also take the carbon component of the carbon dioxide down to the soil where it is stored via various processes of microorganisms working together, specifically the mycorrhizal fungi, which are root symbiotic fungi that collaborate with plants in nutrient exchange. They provide minerals for fungi from bacteria and the soil matrix and exchange that for that carbon. And then they put that carbon into their bodies and actually distribute it to all the soil organisms surrounding that root zone. The tree also drops its limbs and the decomposer fungi decompose those hardy materials back to the mineral component and then the mycorrhizal fungi can feed it back to the plant. So it's a self-feeding system that's designed there through plant and microbial interactions. So the plant provides that carbon that it photosynthesizes, releases oxygen for us, and the microbes utilize that carbon and in exchange provide the plant with all the mineral and elements that the plant needs, as well as us via the consumption of the plant so our bodies can be built from that. So the poop loop, which is also the soil food web, works through this carbon dioxide and nitrogen being fixed from the atmosphere via bacterial and fungal processes being then delivered via those processes. But the fungi and the bacteria are the most nutrient-rich organisms because they are able to pick up nutrients straight from the soil mineral components and pass those on to the plant either via the mycorrhizal network on the roots or through, equally importantly, by being 
consumed so the nutrients can be released. And when the protozoa and the nematodes graze on fungi and bacteria, they themselves have less mineral requirement than the bacteria and the fungi have. So they, by default, have to excrete the nutrients and pass it on to the plant directly. And then any other organisms, all the way up to animals that consume the smaller organisms, will always release that excess nutrients, which will become available to the plant. Therefore, it is called the poop loop. So the plant services that are then provided not only include nutrient cycling and all the minerals that the plant and we need, it also includes carbon sequestration because the carbon is dumped into the soil and stored there for long periods of time when the soil ecosystem functions. This provides soil structure, makes soil spongy, which allows water infiltration, delivery and storage, and therefore drought resistance. And also these organisms via competition, inhibition and predation provide plant immunity. So the plants are actually really, really healthy, resilient against all kinds of stresses as a result of the poop loop functioning well. So the different superheroes we'll discuss, particularly the ones that you can see here in the image, are the plant in itself, which we have just covered its role in the soil ecosystem but also bacteria, which are tiny little round specks that you can see in the background here. Also fungi, which are these hyphal networks, so the cells of fungi we call hyphae. Protozoa, which are these guys here, which consume bacteria, and nematodes, which can consume either bacteria, protozoa, fungi, or other nematodes. So let's go into the bacteria superheroes first. And these are prokaryotic organisms that have no nucleus and no membrane-bound Organelles. That means basically their organs inside are not really demarcated from the rest of the cell. They have a specific area in which they are, but they don't have membranes around them, like in our cells and other eukaryotic cells. But they are the earliest life forms, so the most simple life forms, besides, of course, smaller life forms like viruses, but they are single celled, very tiny, one micrometer, and exist in all environments even at the Earth's core, with extreme pressures and temperature, extremophilic these organisms are, they love extreme conditions, and a teaspoon of fertile soil contains 100 million to 1 billion bacterial cells per acre, and that's equivalent to a ton of bacterial cells per acre, or two cows per acre. We can think of them as our livestock. They contain the carbon content equivalent to all the vegetation on Earth, and a nitrogen and phosphorus content that far exceeds all vegetation. So they are the indispensable nutrient source, and anything that eats bacteria will release those nutrients from them for plant availability. So they can either photosynthesize, some of them actually make their own carbon from sunlight, most actually decompose carbon, so use organic carbon already created by plants, and some are, of course, in relationships with plants and animals through symbiosis, such as parasites, but also our beneficial gut flora, for example. And aerobic conditions where oxygen is present give rise to beneficial forms of bacteria, and when oxygen conditions are reduced, pathogens thrive. A very simple and very reliable process to go by. The most magnificent thing about bacteria is that they are able to grow on rock and decompose that rock and suck up the nutrients from the rock, and therefore they can build soil from the rock surface and also underground. Below soil, they're continually churning that rock layer, the parent rock material. They also bind soil particles together by growing and interacting on soil particles such as sand grain here, and therefore they create structures called microaggregates because they glue via the substances that they produce the soil particles together into aggregate forms and these substances that they produce allow them to adhere to the surface of the rock but also form biofilm structure that allows them to communicate with one another. Those substances are a source of carbon, drought resistance, they allow them to signal to one another and all kinds of incredible superpowers attributed to the bacteria are given to the soil via this production of these extracellular polymeric substances. So bacteria can either live in the bulk soil or they can 
be symbiotic or closer with the root and in the rhizosphere and exchange nutrients with plants right there at the root zone. And some of them are actually endophytic, meaning living inside the plant. And do they work within the plant cells or around the plant cells? And it gets so intimate that some bacteria have become permanent residents of our cells and plant cells, and that's the mitochondria in both plant and animal cells that provides energy production in the cell and the chloroplasts photosynthesize. So it gets more and more intimate, and some of these bacteria basically get picked up by the plant, get stripped of the nutrients directly, and released via the root hairs. And this is called the process of rhizophagy, meaning that the plant literally consumes the bacteria, but the bacteria can regenerate their cell walls and come back to the plant. So they can be engulfed, be either consumed, so to speak, cultivated even, because they're getting thrown out with nutrients to regenerate themselves. And they are endophytic bacteria and very beneficial for the plant in the nutrient cycle system. So plant growth, promoting rhizobacteria, give lots of great benefits to plants. And majority of that is seen via increased plant resistance to drought, salinity, heat, heavy metal, disease, pests increased plant growth and germination and biomass production and nutrient cycling. There are so many fantastic benefits and we can apply these bacteria to our plants and help them help our plants grow better. Some of them fix nitrogen, which is an extremely difficult process to do. And the nitrogen gas in the atmosphere can only be really split by bacteria in order to enter our nutrient cycle and deliver those nutrients for the production of our RNA and DNA and ATP. So that's the currency of our body's energy system. Vitamins, hormones, all of these rely on nitrogen molecules, but the bacteria are the only ones that can split the dinitrogen atom and deliver that to the food web cycle that we're a part of. There are also free living ones that can do this without living on the plant, but a lot of them are called rhizobium bacteria that are actually part of the symbiotic relationship on like beans and peanuts and other legumes. Some of these bacteria solubilize other minerals, including phosphorus, sulfur, and potassium, and these are very complex processes that only bacteria once again can do, and we rely on them for the nutrient access. The next superheroes are the fungi, and as I mentioned earlier, the mycorrhizal fungi are symbiotic with roots and they grow extensively from majority of plants that have them and plants would not have colonized the earth without these symbiotic partners. They deliver nutrients to the plant and exchange that for carbon being so thin, increase the absorptive area of the root by up to a thousand times for both water and nutrients and make the plants grow up to 20% faster than if the plants are just fed by conventional chemical fertilizers, which actually get rid of these fungi. The mycelium, or the network of these high full fungal cells, just four meters square of perennial grassland mycelium can stretch around the equator, just to give you the weight of the enormity of these organisms in the soil if the ecosystem functions well. And of course, being there on the root, it increases the surface area of the plant and really allows for other interactions to occur in the soil, making it a fabulous system for organisms to function in. Some of these fungi produce little arbuscules, so that means tiny tree living inside the plant where the nutrient exchange occurs between the cell membrane and the cell wall. So the nutrients are delivered from outside straight via this tiny little tree arbuscule into the plant cell for delivery. And these are arbuscules stained so we can visualize them in the plant cells. These arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi also produce this gluey substance called glomalin that actually sequesters carbon and makes that carbon available for long term in the ground for all the organisms to function well. So up to 40% of glomalin is carbon. Mycorrhizal fungi help plants to grow better. There we go. One with fungi, one without. Same with this corn root. Much greater root system and yields of our plants increase as a result. The other group of essential fungi are the decomposers, and I won't show you any more beautiful photos than this, 
but you can imagine the beauty of fungi in ecosystems when you go through a forest you can see how many varieties and colors there are but their role really is to decompose hardy substances such as wood and leaf material and then mineralize that wood and transform that into the mineral component for plant and microbe absorption so they feed plants by deconstructing all the organic matter and that creates so structure everything spongy when these high fibrous mycelium exists and also the carbon is broken down and that makes soils nice and spongy and they feed a lot of different organisms like nematodes which we'll talk about and micro and macro arthropods and earthworms of course love fungi too and this is just an example showing wood being decomposed by lovely thick growth of mycelium and some stitching of leaves with these little fungal outgrowths that then consume the leaf as they grow. The way they function is they release enzymes onto the wood or onto the leaf and absorb the nutrients directly from the plant matter. And you can see the carbon in the cell walls of the fungi, that dark color, that's your fulvic or humic acids, and that's the carbon shell that they use to protect themselves with. So if they die, they leave this shell and that is part of what makes humus. It stores carbon in the ground and you can see these hyphae in the electron micrograph and the carbon present in them, the liquid carbon that they then deliver to other organisms. So fungi transform and incorporate plant carbon. They produce carbon byproducts and when fungi are present in the soil, they increase carbon retention. And fungi are very much missing from our soils, specifically in agriculture. But the fact that fungal proliferation moves forward in succession and increases actually drives ecological succession. So initially when rock is present, only bacteria can function and grow. And as organic matter is developed, as the bacteria die and other organisms start to grow like lichens, photosynthesize and drop that debris of carbon. And by the way, lichens also are fungi. They start producing the organic matter and fungi can start to proliferate. And as initially there is no fungi at all, that fungal biomass far exceeds that of bacteria. And only then, when that happens, the ecosystem reaches maturity or final succession or pinnacle of succession, driving forest ecosystems. Also, the organic matter from the plants and the soil life together create soil structure, making incredible potential for that soil to hold moisture to allow little creatures to live in the pores for worms to move through it's just a wonderful system that can be gained and this is fungi holding some of the particles like sand together that you can see they glue it together making sure that water can infiltrate and this is an electron micrograph image showing that these fungi go around and hug the soil particles together or hug plant residue to the mineral component and bacterial glues and bacteria make the microaggregates and then the hyphae then hug those microaggregates into macroaggregates which you can see here perfectly as the hyphae hug the soil particles together and this allows for structure in the soil where water and nutrients and air become available and therefore organisms can function. So for all those nutrients to be released we need the creatures called protozoa or protists and these are unicellular organisms that are clumped into one group because they are not plants, they are not animals or fungi but the microscopic ones that live in soil are actually essential for this nutrient cycling to occur and they do this by engulfing bacteria and other protozoa and other small organisms into themselves and then digesting them and pooing out or pooping out the nutrients for the plant. They can also be symbiotic and live inside different organisms, but also some protists like little algae, green algae, live inside other protists. And so it allows them to photosynthesize, but also they can be beneficial in the symbiosis or be parasitic. Some of them are phototrophic and photosynthesize and some also decompose organic matter as well. Some of them are called flagellates and they're tiny and they have a flagellum so it propels them through the soil. This is what it looks like when they propel themselves. Some of them indicate reduced oxygen conditions and we call them ciliates and they are gorgeous and they're so fun to follow under the microscope. 
But the ones we'll talk about the most are the amoebae, and they eat bacteria and other protozoa. And one protozoan, one little microscopic unicellular amoeba or flagellate, can consume 10,000 bacteria per day. And they've also become food for many organisms. But by consuming this large amount of bacteria, they actually poo out the excess nutrients from the bacteria and feed the plant directly. Some of them, called testator amoebae, form intricate shells around them to protect themselves. And these are just some of the shells with beautiful patterns and designs that they create on their shells. Some use diatoms, which are also protists, and use those shells. Or some of them, even like a crab, can use the shells of other amoebae. But the shells have beautiful designs. And this is an amoeba inside. They kind of come out like a little snail and move with the pseudopodia, like a shape-shifting organism that they are that you can see here and some of them are mixotrophs where they actually allow algae to live inside of them so they can gain carbon but also will digest other organisms in gulf bacteria and can have both ways of feeding depending on whether sunlight is available or not but they symbiotically take in these algae and can coexist with them in that way some of them are extraordinary they can mate and form slime molds which we see spread sometimes over wood and these giant cells called the plasmodium have spatial memory and learned behavior transfer so they are extensively studied and here the tokyo network of the subway has been mapped by putting an amoeboid physarum so that one of the species that is being studied that i just showed you and all the different stations are spread around this city and this is how it looks. And then eventually over a 26-hour period, the plasmodium, the big cell that they form, looks for food because these are oat flakes. All the little cities are oat flakes and they want to eat those oat flakes or the bacteria on them. And they keep finding the shortest route to their food source until eventually they fortify the shortest route. And that resembles exactly the Tokyo subway that connects all these 36 cities, but also makes it more efficient where there were blockages before scientists are able to see what is the most efficient route where they could improve the network of their subway. That same algorithm, then the growth of that Fizarum slime mold has been used to map out the pattern of the cosmic web, which is the dark matter distribution within the universe. And they use this because they know that this mathematical equation of that growth can now be used to determine many patterns of how very many things in nature are formed. Just quickly to show you how they look, they form amazing structures. This is the pretzel slime mold. These guys form sporangia, so this is all to produce spore-releasing structures. But just to show you the beauty of how these amoebae form these fruiting bodies that are just insanely gorgeous. <laughs> Some of them cushion shaped, so wolf's milk. This is dog's vomit, not a nice name for a gorgeous creature. And there's also this gorgeous red raspberry slime. The other type of slime molds are cellular slime molds, and these are amoebae coming together to form one organism. <laughs> form a slug and so this slug the life cycle of that is that when amoebae replicate and they just basically clone themselves when they grow and the food runs out they go into starvation mode some of them will release this chemical cyclic amp and this hormone allows them to aggregate they aggregate into a mound eventually forming what we call a slug when the slug travels to a better location, some of the amoebae become sentinel cells. They become immune system cells such as ours to protect the slug so it can go to a better place to form a fruiting body and release its spores. And the cell, the sentinel cell, has exactly the same function as our immune cells. We've got them as well, these sentinel cells. They recognize any threat like bacteria coming to attack the migrating slug and basically consume them and consume any toxins, anything that will threaten this little slug. So at any point they can move away and become individuals, but they stick together forming the slug and then over 24 hours this process continues changing their shape until a fruiting body is formed and the sorus then releases the spores. And in social development studies they're looking at 
why 80% of all the different clones choose to be in the Soros to reproduce, so therefore survive, but 20% go into the stalk and die. How does that happen? Scientists are studying because these guys will basically sacrifice themselves to be the stalk for others to keep reproducing. This is the slug, but these amoebae and the slug that they produce are great model organism for biomedical studies. So very interesting studies come out and knowledge is built as a result of these organisms being studied, these cellular slime molds, very essential in all kinds of disease studies. So the last group we'll pretty much look at besides these little creatures are the nematodes. And the nematodes basically are multicellular organisms, so they're little worms. 80% of animals are actually these worms. They live in all kinds of habitats and 30,000 have been described, but more than a million are probably out there that haven't been even studied yet. So they live anywhere from tree canopies to anaerobic marine sediments and are just extraordinary. And in fact, three Nobel Prizes have been won through the studies of these organisms for sequencing the first genome of any organism. Also, they can withstand gravity pressure or the g-force of 400,000 humans basically lose consciousness at 5 g. And this is the force required to overcome gravity at Earth's surface. So you can imagine that the reason why scientists are studying that is because they are looking at how volcanic eruptions cause dissemination of some organisms to restart ecosystems, but also when asteroids impact the Earth, can these organisms that are in the rock that is exploded catapult themselves into space? And this is what they call ballistic panspermia. So seeding other planets, is it possible for these guys to survive and seed other planets with life? And even though they have no eyes, they detect UV at up to 100 times that of the human eye, which is crazy in itself. But also they have huge survival potential and being locked up in the fridge at five degrees for 32 years, you can open them up and the weed gold larvae will actually regain function. They have beautiful mouth parts that we identify them by. Some of them feed on bacteria, some feed on fungi, some on roots, some are predatory and some are omnivorous. And by ingesting all these organisms, they can then take on lots of nutrient into their body and ensure that there is greater plant biomass by increasing nutrient content in the soil. They also incorporate fungal and bacterial biomass, specifically carbon, so they contribute to soil organic carbon retention. They've got a very carbon-rich cuticle. When they themselves are eaten, that carbon cuticle remains in the soil. This is nutrients coming out of a bum of a nematode that I got to see in action, releasing those nutrients. So that was really fun, but that's the face of the nematode, and this is the poo that it exudes. And they, of course, feed many different organisms. All kinds of organisms require them as food. But this is a beautiful mouth of a bacterial feeding nematode. This is a fungal feeding nematode. This is a root feeding nematode. You can see the piercing mouth parts here. That's going to come out and pierce the fungal cell wall. Plant cell wall is harder to pierce, so there's a muscle that pushes the hypodermic needle into the plant. These are gorgeous teeth of a predatory nematode, so scary mouth. This is what it looks like on the side with a tooth there. And they feed on other nematodes and then leave that carbon-rich cuticle. And some fungi love to eat nematodes. They produce these traps and the nematode gets attracted to the hormone. The fungus releases that, attracts the <laughs> nematode, goes in and then they pump water into this little loop and then tighten and then suck out the contents and some of the fungi will grow throughout the nematode. And also amoebae, little testator amoebae, can hunt pack, it turns out, nematodes, even though this was discovered by accident because they were trying to feed amoebae to nematodes and it turns out that the nematode numbers were decreasing, but amoebae numbers increasing. So therefore, it was the pack hunting, and they can completely digest a nematode within 12 hours, but they collaborate to consume nematodes. Just depends on what happens in the ecosystem. And then finally, we've got the microfauna and mesofauna. So the organisms that feed on all these other groups, but particularly these grazes of fungi and bacteria, and they've got less nutrients in them than the fungi and bacteria originally had or their predators had, and therefore all of that nutrient, including that of animals and owls, can be potentially, if the systems are set up correctly, fed to plants. 
So these microfauna include microscopic mites, very rarely studied but extremely important in the ecosystem. Beautiful mesofauna like the springtails, which I absolutely adore. They love eating fungi, just love these little guys. They're so sweet. And look them up. Look up Chaos of Delight, a website I highly recommend to learn more about these guys by a photographer that is obsessed with them. And of course, earthworms, they consume and cultivate these microbes and disseminate all these organisms through soils. So extremely important to have earthworms as part of the ecosystem. If we actually cultivate rich microbial systems, we can actually transform heavily tilled dirt, dust that flows off into the atmosphere and pollutes oceans and we lose all our nutrients. We can actually regenerate it. So this is a compost amended soil and this is so comparable now to a natural untouched pasture. So we can actually do this. And the way that I do it is through microscopy where I look at an existing ecosystem of a soil or a compost, count the organisms, know what's there, know what's missing, and we can work with farmers to help them to increase the biomass by producing composts, particularly vermicompost, so worm farms that will create these beautiful ecosystems that we can put in the soil. And the other practical application for anyone really I recommend is to convert really old grazing land because cows cannot live any longer on the current complete devastation that we've created. We've destroyed the soil through grazing particularly Majority of Australia is grazed, 70% of the landscape is grazed with cleared forest. We need to put the forest back if we're going to survive. We need to grow native ground covers and shrubs and trees. We need to restore the water cycle. And the only way that can happen is through the pump that plants provide, particularly trees. We need to build organic matter. We need to chop and drop rather than burn. We need to have our weeds used rather than poisoned. We need to use their biomass and actually put it in the ground, compost it, use it, do something with it to regenerate the landscape so that native vegetation can come back and apply compost to speed up microbial succession. So this is what we can do, and we can do this on mass scale. We can go out in groups and we can actually regenerate the landscape through various methods that I'm passionate about that I cover in the course. You can also at home set up a worm farm called the Willy Worm Flow that I've been running workshops with people to show them how to build it. But you put some grid in the bottom of it so you can harvest the mature castings. But at the top, you've got a lovely system to feed the worms without disturbance. There's a very specific way to set this up, which is really nice and very easy. And I'm more than happy to provide a link to an article I wrote about it. But the bedding is 20 centimeters and you can use anything from Koya, which is probably the best and easiest way. Coconut shreds to use those and get some compost from someone, get some worms, make sure there's lots of moisture in there for them to live on and then add thin layers of food and organic material like carbon, leaf matter particularly. Harvest that, put on top, make sure it's moist. And then when food is gone, keep feeding your waste and you can put your waste so it doesn't go off in the fridge or freezer. And that's what I do when I feed my several worm farms. And then you wait for maybe a year for this really to consolidate and then scrape it out with a little rake underneath. And this is what it looks like when you put it in those slats and then you basically harvest it. This is the food source that I'm proposing. Very light organic matter. Don't get go crazy with hardwood. But lots of food except, of course, no citrus and no garlic, no meat, no dairy, but everything else pretty much can go into feed the microbes that the worms will feed on. That's what they feed on. And lots of lovely leaf matter always. Then once you get the compost ready, you can make a slurry to inoculate onto seeds or you can put it into a tea bag, any nylon bag that you can release the microbes, dislodge you, massage them off, massage them out of this compost into the water, and then you can return the compost or feed it to your plants, and then you can spray it. And that's probably the most efficient way to inoculate soils and plants with the microbial population that you've just grown in your worm farm. So this is it for me, guys. I enjoyed giving this presentation. If you want to contact me, I'm all about giving soils at gmail.com. The soilrestorationcourse.com website will give you more information about the course. I'd love for people to do this course. I'll go into all these organisms and describe all the wonderful gifts that they give and the fascinating facts about them and how they're being studied. I also do soil microscopy. You can also sign up to a monthly newsletter, so I encourage you to sign up. 
you can do that via the website. There's also a consultancy. I work with farmers. I really want to get into hands-on land regeneration with people that are passionate about restoring our ecosystems. All right. Thanks so much. Bye for now.